Hello, and welcome to Reporting the World. I'm John Dancy, Director of International Media Studies at Brigham Young University. The United States Congress, is it, as some have said, the world's greatest deliberative body? Or is it an institution so given to power struggles and partisan politics that it no longer acts as the people's voice in government? And what role does the press have in forming the public's opinion of Congress? As you know, if you're a regular viewer of this series of programs, we use this hour to take a hard look at how the press covers a segment of the American government. On this broadcast, that institution will be the U.S. Congress. Joining us today is former New Hampshire Senator Warren Rudman. While serving two terms in the Senate, he was one of the authors of the Graham Rudman Hollings Act, which forced discipline and accountability on an out-of-control federal budget process. Most congressional observers see it as one of the most important pieces of legislation of the 1980s. Senator Rudman never shied away from high-profile controversy. He was vice chairman of the Iran-Contra Committee and was highly regarded for his tough, objective questioning. He also served as chairman of the Senate Ethics Committee, a post that put him in the position of having to call his fellow senators to account for their dealings on many occasions. After his retirement from the Senate in 1992, his reputation for straight talk and integrity made him the indispensable man in Washington. He is an advisor to presidents and cabinet secretaries and is frequently called in to handle the most sensitive of issues, such as the investigation into the Gulf War syndrome. He serves currently as chairman of the president's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board one of the least known but most important groups in Washington because of its super secret knowledge of the nation's intelligence agencies. Guy Gugliotta of the Washington Post has covered the U.S. Congress for the seven of the past nine years. He's had a front row seat at the impeachment trial of President Clinton, the Republican Revolution of 1994, and hearings into the campaign finance reform issue. He has been a daily observer of the power struggles that are a fact of life in Washington. He's a keen observer of the way Congress works or fails to work. Dr. Kelly Patterson is chair of the Department of Political Science at Brigham Young University. He has been a congressional fellow spending a year working on the staff of the Democratic Caucus in the House of Representatives. He is the author of numerous publications including Political Parties and the Maintenance of Liberal Democracy. And in the interest of full disclosure, I should tell you that my own career included seven years covering the U.S. Congress as a network television correspondent. Let's begin with Senator Rudman. Senator, does the press have a role in the low esteem in which the Congress is held uh, on the part of the American people? Well, I think some role, uh, and you'd have to come to that conclusion because what the, co what the people in this country know about the Congress, they know largely, I guess the latest figures are 90, 95 percent from television coverage. Now, then you have to reach a decision. Was the coverage so selective as to make the Congress look bad, or was the coverage accurate and it made the Congress look bad because that's the way they were? So, you know, that, that is kind of a, a circular thing. My sense is that the media from time to time tends to concentrate on the negative. You don't see too many uh, headlines leading the nightly news saying, 400 great members of Congress walked through the doors today. So people get a, a diet of, of, of something less than good behavior, uh, then of course uh, television contributes to that. Having said that, my own sense is that the last few years in particular has been so, bi so much bipartisan bickering, so much hate, which I did not see when I was there, and such a cleavage between the executive branch and the Republicans in, in, in the House and the Senate that the people are bound to be a little querulous about what kind of institution it really is. Guy, let me ask you this to, to help the audience understand um, how the press goes about reporting Congress. Talk a little about your day, how you would organize your day as a congressional reporter, how you would pitch stories, and how we'd get those stories in the paper. Sure. It's, um, Congress is the last low-tech um, aspect of our business, I think. Um, it's the only place that I've worked in uh, where you can find the principal people you want to talk to simply by going downstairs and um, uh, grabbing them by the shoulder or getting their attention. If I want to talk to Senator Rudman, I wait until a vote and I go down and stand by the elevators and when he comes off the floor I grab a hold of him and I ask him about what I'm interested in. Do you know how you do this without the internet? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, in the House of Representatives, it's the same. It's the same thing. Um, it's uh, it's the closest thing.
to a uh, state within a state that we have in this country. Uh, until recently, uh, laws that applied to most of us didn't really apply to Congress. Um, the cops are Congress's own cops. They're not local mm -hmm. cops. There's a, a, a very, very uh, well-defined and well-perceived division of power. Uh, the uh, president comes up to Congress when he's invited. Uh, <clears throat> cabinet members come up when they are invited. Uh, it's very easy to cover. It's very easy to know what the issues are, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's very easy to follow them on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, today, for instance, I'm sure that we're looking at uh, uh, budget negotiations that run uh, in and out, uh, in and out of the congressional session uh, throughout. So you know what's going on all the time. What uh, the challenge, of course, is uh, to separate uh, what you really need from the huge volume of material that's, uh, that's being put out. And uh, in that case, you usually have to read up, understand what's going on, understand who knows about it, and find them. Finding them is the uh, least difficult part of it. I, I know from, from my own experience with the television network, the television networks tend to look at Congress as a, as a bunch of guys in polyester suits uh, who, are, who are not really serious about politics, who are, who are basically sort of dim-witted and, and uh, anxious to push their own political agenda. Does the Post have a similar bias against Congress? Oh, no. Uh, we're, we regard ourselves as the hometown paper of record in Washington. We take ourselves deadly seriously. I have to I have to say that when I first came up to cover Congress I sort of did think they were a bunch of polyester suited buffoons uh, but well, um, right here, yeah exactly <laughs> right. and, uh, but as time passed I came to uh, have a greater and greater respect for what they do what uh, what Congress does is very hard it's very complicated it's very difficult to understand and uh, senators and um, the house members spend long long incredibly long hours doing it Kelly, you, you got a chance to have a front row seat at Congress for a year. As an academic, you went to Congress as a congressional fellow and got to spend time on the staff of one of the, uh, of one of the standing uh, committees there. Uh, was that your reaction as well, that it's a, lot, it's a lot harder from the inside than it is from the outside? Yeah, it, it is very difficult. When I left Congress, uh, one, of the col one of my colleagues penned a note to me in a, in a card saying, good luck explaining how this works <laughs> to the outside world. And uh, that's very true. There are so many personalities involved in any given uh, negotiation over a piece of public policy. And there are so many rules that structure how the policy process works. And there are so many twists and turns in the policy process itself, that that very complexity makes it very, very difficult, I think, to convey to anybody in, in a newspaper article or on a two or three minute uh, television uh, news uh, program, if, you're, if you even get that much. So yes, I, I found it very, uh, very complex and uh, certainly came away with a much greater appreciation for the job they do. Do you think the American people don't appreciate enough what goes on in Congress? I don't think the American people appreciate enough what uh, goes on in Congress. The, and the public opinion polls show that uh, I think the uh, the nader or the of um, the public opinion polls was probably uh, the last uh, last couple of years where they they've done pretty well uh, withstanding. But the, the bottom out occurred in 1992 when I was there. 17 percent of the American people had uh, a confidence in the 17% job. 17 percent out of only 17 percent expressed approval. Mm -hmm. uh, the Amer uh, 17 percent of the American people expressed approval in the job that Congress was doing. And this was in the middle of the Perk scandal, the, the House Bank scandal, and, and everything else that was going on. And that, uh, if, when the public gets a steady diet of those kinds of scandals, it's very hard to, to, to break through that and say, well, in addition to all these scandals that seem to be swirling around the hill, they're actually doing some things. I think a, a real bad fallout of precisely this was that an awful lot of new uh, uh, senators and, and House and House members in particular came into Congress subsequent to this period running against Congress, running against the institution. And uh, they uh, say, well, uh, Congress is terrible, we have to clean it up. And they say, government's terrible, uh, and uh, uh, public service is terrible, I can do this. And so they end up running down the institution. So then they come in and they wonder why the institution continues to get bad marks. And in fact, they've, uh, uh, simply by bad-mouthing it so often, to get in, they contribute to that. 
Of course, <clears throat> the other problem is a is a lack of understanding of what the Congress does. I mean, the Congress is the legislative branch of the government. Uh, it uh, takes issues and decides whether or not there ought to be legislation uh, to solve problems, which some people perceive and others don't. Good example, health care. Uh, there are a tremendous number of people in this country who believe that there ought to be more universal health care, health care delivered a different way, and are willing to pay for it because it must be paid for. We, we are all through, I think, deficit spending, which got us into the mess we we're in. So you have this large group who feels this way. You have another large, represented by a number of members of Congress, House and Senate. You have another group that says, that would be nice, but we can't afford it. I can't afford another 4% on my FICA from 7 and 3 quarter to 11%. I'm against it. So they go at each other all year long. Nothing happens. The press says there's gridlock going on. Well, that is the purpose of the legislative process. There ought to be gridlock going on until there is an overwhelming amount of support for something which can get to the White House and get signed. So people misunderstand. They say they're always fighting with each other. Well, they're fighting with each other in many cases because they have substantial disagreement. So that's not understood either, it seems to me. But, uh, uh, there's an interesting paradox here, too. that when you look at the research on what people know about Congress and how it affects their opinions toward Congress, the more people know about Congress and the more educated they are about Congress, the less they actually like what Congress does. Mm -hmm. And that goes right to the what heart of that what... Suggest? Yeah, well, that suggest? You goes, should have well, less programs like this? <laughs> probably. <laughs> probably, but the, it goes right to the heart, I think, of what what is known about Congress and what's reported about mm -hmm. Congress because it's what they take away from the process itself. They don't see it as a neat, clean, deliberative process, mm -hmm. but they see it as a process fraught with special interests, fraught with partisan bickering, mm -hmm. and all these other problems, and they get into it and see it that way, and they just... Mm -hmm. uh, an early American state, statesman once said that, that uh, the Senate particularly, not, not the House of Representatives, but the Senate, was the place where the passions of the country are saucered and blowed. In other words, where the passions are allowed to cool down and uh, time and uh, legislative gridlock, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, affect those and give time for, for passions to cool. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that happening or is, is, is the Congress so partisan now that it can't happen? Well, I, I won't say it cannot happen, but I certainly think that it's happening less. Uh, Having said that, there is no question, I think, anyone who covers the Congress, that the Senate will be slower, more deliberative, uh, more careful, more apt to gridlock because of its rules in the House, and that is as it should be. I mean, the Senate was created to deliberately make it more difficult to pass legislation or treaties or, or nominate people because the idea was that it should be deliberative, it should take time. So the system makes it so. But there's been so much ideological conflict lately that, that it doesn't look very deliberative. The only thing that makes it deliberative today are the rules, really, uh, more than the individuals, in my own view. Do you think people understand that the process is supposed to be slow? I, I don't think so. Uh, I, I, I don't believe so. Uh, and it's a darn good thing that it is because, uh, well, let's take the recent treaty that was rejected, which kind of a regrettable thing in many ways, but let's assume that treaty was in the in, in not in the best interest, hypothetically. Just assume that. I don't necessarily believe that. And it's probably good that it was either defeated or, 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 or not voted on because we could make some terrible mistakes. And the, the Senate has always been there to, to do these things, in the main, to agree with presidents. And that, that piece of legislation had been sitting there languishing for years, years. in fact, before, for uh, years. before it ever even well, came Well, there are up. a number of treaties, John, that are languishing in the Senate uh, that have uh, been uh, signed by various presidents and who the Senate has chosen not to ratify. Mm -hmm. That's the way the Founding Fathers wanted it to be. Is that good? Uh, in some cases, maybe it is. In other cases, it, it isn't. But, but the one thing you have to worry about in a democracy, that it, that it becomes too neat and clean. If you're looking for a neat, clean government, I commend Nazi Germany between 1932 and 1941. It was very, very neat, very efficient, very neat and clean. We surely don't need you know, that kind of efficiency. So when people complain about things being too slow and too deliberative, I like to remind them, you know, uh, that's okay. I mean, we have the Constitution, we've got the Bill of Rights. Uh, when there's a major problem, the Congress will normally do something about it. So I guess people ought to understand better that's the way it's supposed to be. 
Let me, let me ask you, Senator, when you were in the Senate, how did you, how did you order your relations with the press? How did, you, uh, how did you go about dealing with the press? Well, I have to answer that by, by, by essentially setting a predicate for the question. I, I decided early on that if you're going to get anything done in the Senate, if you're going to build any support for it, you had to have access to press who knew the story, understood it, were willing to give it its relative value and do something with it. So I made it a point to get to know people like yourself, like others who work for the major networks, to make sure that there was someone I could talk to. Now, they would have to judge whether it was a story or it wasn't a story, and, and, and that was, of course, a journalistic decision. Uh, so what we did in our office is we essentially said, uh, press releases, trying to spin the press, uh, that, that won't work. If you get something substantive going on, then make sure you're available to the press to tell them the truth and tell them what's going on. And it's interesting, if it's a real story, if it's a story the American people probably will be interested in, then you go to any first-class journalist and, uh, and, and, and you'll make sure that story gets out. There is no way to get something done legislatively in this country unless you have strong press coverage of it. It just won't happen. Uh, what's your reaction to that guy, the, 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 the strategy that Senator Rubin just laid out? Well, I think that's, uh, I think that's accurate. I think that uh, it is almost impossible to get anything substantive done in the country without, uh, uh, without strong publicity and without, uh, without people knowing about it. And that's important. I think that's part of our system. Um, it is, in fact, however, uh, quite easy to get something small done for a particular constituency without anybody oh, knowing sure. about it. Oh, and, sure. Uh, well, that's different, of course. And, uh, but, uh, like you don't want the press to know about that. <laughs> exactly, yeah, <laughs> precisely. You but, want the right press to know. <laughs> but even those things, the little, uh, the, uh, the firehouse back home or the courthouse, or, I think that's part of the system, too. That's factored in, and that's, uh, that's part of the way it works. It's messy. It's very messy. And, uh, uh, and I have uh, and learned to have the greatest respect for the uh, for the lawmakers that can sort of navigate their way through this minefield, and uh, and I valued and I value among my colleagues and ourselves the ability to explain this in such a way that it uh, that it appeals to somebody besides just inside baseball players. Mm -hmm. Senator, talk a little about the difference between the national press and your state press. How did you deal with them, and was it different? Oh, enormously different. Uh, uh, the state, I don't, I don't mean to in any way, uh, you know, insult or demean the local press. They're very good at what they're supposed to do. I mean, the State House Press Corps in New Hampshire understands all of the issues that the governor and the legislature are faced with. Uh, they understand it completely. The local reporters understand what's going on at City Hall and what the battle is. They mainly don't have a clue as to what the national issues are. So if you're a United States senator or a congressman, uh, you have to be take a lot of time when you go home to explain to your local press the significance of the issues uh, that you're working. Now, contrast that with the national press, who are like sharks cruising just below the surface. Number one, they know as much about the subject as members of Congress. I mean, that's their job. I mean, if you're an NBC correspondent or you're a correspondent of the Washington Post, uh, you're being paid a pretty fair amount of money to do your job and to know the subject. So you're dealing with very knowledgeable people. You, you're dealing with people that you can't spin or even try to. And you're dealing with people who are going to ask you very tough questions because they know the subject. So great difference. Uh, I used to love to go home to talk about national issues at New Hampshire. It was a lot easier. On the other hand, uh, they, they learned, the local press learned, but they certainly could not have the depth of knowledge that you would have as a member of the Washington Press Corps. And that, by the way, is something that people who are running for president who have not come from Washington find out very quickly. What, out very quickly. what was your reaction when you felt like you were being spun by a senator or by his staff? Oh, I would just tell me, you know, you can stop that right now. And uh, it's just, it's the, the only time that that ever happened was when either when a senator or a House member's new or when uh, the press secretary's new. Right. And they'll call you up and say, well, my senator so-and-so is going to drop a bill to do, uh, to have daylight savings time, the data daylight savings time changed. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, first, just introducing a bill is nothing. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, second, uh, changing the, the date of daylight savings time isn't going to fly. And say, well, thank you very much. <laughs> and that's it. Well, on the other hand, when there's something really important that's going to happen, and then the national press picked up on it. I'm going to give you an example, uh, John, that you were part of. Uh, in November of 1985, uh, Phil Graham and I decided, against all odds, that we would put together Graham Rudman, which eventually became Graham Rudman Hollings. And we knew it was going to be a tremendous battle because Ronald Reagan opposed it originally, of course. The, the, just for, let me explain for a moment, yeah. for, for people who don't follow this issue closely, right. the Graham Rudman Hollings Act was the act which, uh, which brought some financial sanity to the federal budget process. Headed in the direction of balancing the budget. Right. It was a major issue. You will recall, how did we start that? Did we start that with speeches on the floor, with meetings in the White House? Uh-uh. We invited 20 of the top journalists in Washington to a breakfast in the Capitol at 7.30 in the morning and said we had a major bill to put forth, and the hook to get them there was we were going to essentially stop the government from borrowing any more money because that was on the so-called debt extension, which is too complex for this program. Make a long story short, they all came. Now, they all left. They probably thought these two guys are crazy. I don't know what you thought, but they <laughs> all wrote stories. They all reported it on it. And that following day, the Washington Post and the New York Times and three networks said there is a threat here to the president and his administration from two freshman Republicans. And within three days, it was probably the most covered piece of legislation in the last, what, 25 years? Uh, uh, it's a good thing you turned out to be serious. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> good thing we were sane, right? right? <laughs> uh, but but that, that is an example of how to use in a constructive way the press. I mean, you all reported on it and followed it, and it went down to the mat. It finally passed in late December. What, uh, to, let's, let's follow that for a moment. To what effect uh, does cooperation with the press give you more power in Congress? Well... Uh, look, although you'd like to deny it, you're all human beings. Uh, and uh, you're apt to be nicer to people who are nice to you than people who are rotten to you. That's not to say that you're going to go out of your way to protect someone, uh, that a bad story should be written about. That Senator John Smith was seen hanging from a lamp pole at midnight uh, by his ankles drinking a bottle of champagne. I mean, he may be your best friend, but you've got to run that story. Fact is, however, if a person comes to you and says, you know, I've got this piece of legislation, you know, I really wish you people would take a good look at it. I think you might have to take a look at it. Now, if it's worthless, then you're not going to do anything about it. But it's not like, it's not an incestuous relationship, but friends are friends. I mean, uh, and, and you tend also to respect people who are your friends, or hopefully they wouldn't be your friends. We have, uh, we have a, re a real interesting procedure to deal with that. If I'm covering Congress day to day, and I'm developing a relationship with Senator Warren Rudman, then if Senator Warren Rudman has done something real bad, and our paper suspects it, I'm not going to be the person that exactly. covers that. Exactly. We're going to have somebody else that doesn't know Senator Rudman exactly. and doesn't need to know Senator exactly. Rudman to do that investigation. Exactly. And I think most major newspapers will, and, and probably uh, networks will do the same thing. Because uh, I have to have a relationship with him, and, uh, but investigative reporters do not. What happens, what happens, don't you think, Guy, is that, is that reporters develop uh, a relationship because these are, these are real warm, live human beings that you're dealing with. They're well, not, they're not caricatures. Yeah, right. They're not just caricatures. Yeah, yeah, I think right. that's right. And you know, what, what, you know what, what the people out there don't understand when, when they look at the press uh, political relationship, they don't understand that for a period of about a year, I dealt with a small group of reporters every single day. It was during the Keating Five. They were waiting out my, uh, outside of my office when I came in at 9 in the morning. They were outside the ethics committee room all day. And, you know, uh, they'd say, well, you sit and have a cup of coffee with us. Can we talk to you? And, you know, just give us a sense of what's happening, where you're going. This is a big story. So, you, you know, you get to know people. So at the end of that year, either they think you're a pretty good person or they think you're a nut and they don't want to be around you. But, I mean, uh, the fact is you, you can't help but build those kind of relationships with people. And I, you know, I always tell people that, uh, that you know, I don't have to name names here, but I always say that there were about a dozen people in the National Press Corps I, I, you know, I just had enormous regard for, and I consider them friends. 
Not it, friends that they would go out of their way to do anything good for me, but friends that I could enjoy their company. And, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. Guy, you you covered the Hill through the through the whole Gingrich Revolution in right. 1994. Um, is is that the point at which a more confrontational Congress came into being, where members uh, look for partisan advantage rather than the usual comity of uh, of uh, the Congress? I think definitely. I think it started with Gingrich himself, who had uh, built uh, built his power base and eventually led the takeover of the Congress in '94 with a confrontational bomb throwing style that he perfected during 10, 12, 14, 15 years in the uh, in the in the minority. Uh, these folks come to power in 1995, and uh, they had a 75-member freshman class. An awful lot of them, uh, people who matured politically, sort of sitting at uh, Newt Gingrich's knee. And so they shared his kind of confrontational uh, conservative style. Uh, you couple that with uh, the Democrats' shock and resentment. Uh, of having lost control of the House for 40 years, mm -hmm. and uh, you had a real volatile mix, and uh, neither side backed off, and the atmosphere in the House of Representatives soured horribly right from day one. I should say that in the Senate, the transition was much gentler. First, uh, Republicans had held the majority uh, back uh, in, from 1980 to 1986. And so uh, Democrats were much more accustomed to not running the show. And you also had uh, Senator Dole as the majority leader, uh, a man who could uh, stand up, sort of stretch out his arms and say, OK, that's enough, and make people stop. Uh, neither Gingrich nor Gebhardt in the House had any desire to do that. And, and what you had, too, was a speaker now, a new speaker, Speaker Gingrich, mm -hmm. who decided consciously to pursue an outsider strategy. Mm -hmm. That is, he was going to hold daily press briefings, and he was going to get his message out. And he was on the record as saying, if you're not in the Washington Post or the New York Times on a daily basis, you're losing. And he was out there to try and get his message out to, in this battle for public opinion. He, and, but, uh, but, but he, and, and that preceded, I mean, that was preceded by numerous speakers who cultivated these inside relationships and, and built these relationships with the press and, and did their very best to get coverage for Congress and for the members through a much more collegial social uh, interaction than this coming out and bombarding the press. There was something else. <clears throat> that, you know, we're talking about that whole era. Uh, I'll be just brief. I know Guy wants to say something. Uh, it was also payback time. Uh, uh, <laughs> a certain amount of that. I, I mean, no, uh, you, look, look, everybody's human. You know, you get a lot of young people hopefully watching this. I mean, you know, if anybody thinks that the uh, human emotions stop at a particular age, they don't. They just hopefully are controlled better. Uh, <laughs> fact is, fact is that the Democrats had been in the, in the majority for 40 years. They had treated the Republican minority, and I this to me from some of my dear friends who are Democrats in the House. They treated the Republicans shamefully for many of those years. They gave them nothing. They gave them very little legislative opportunity. They wrote the rules. They steamrolled them. I mean, people as nice as Bob Michael from Michigan, who was certainly a decent human being, was just kind of given the back of everybody's hand. Oh, well, they'd invite him to some event occasionally, but essentially they ran the place with an iron hand because the rules of the House allow that. The Senate rules don't allow that. Now, Gingrich and company get elected. Let me tell you, I had heard many conversations that we're going to teach those people what they did to us for the last 40 years. Well, it was like, you know, it was like the Greco-Roman uh, Wars. I mean, uh, and, uh, and that went on for a year before everybody drew back a bit and said, uh, I think you're agreeing this isn't the best way to run the country. Yeah, we, better, we better stop this. Okay. Okay. There was hey, a lot of that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I think one of the things I wanted to say when uh, when Kelly was speaking, and it applies to what you just said too, Senator, is that um, when the Republicans came in, you see, Gingrich took a lot of this on himself. One of the things I noticed uh, from day one was that uh, within the Republican caucus, they changed a whole lot of rules about the way things were going to operate. The speaker became much more powerful than he had been under uh, uh, during the Democrat, Democratic regime. They imposed term limits on committee chairmen. Uh, Gingrich and Army, the new majority leader, made a special effort to cultivate this 75-member block of new freshmen, people that they could use as a hammer against uh, the older folks in, in their own caucus. Uh, 
but Gingrich was a much more powerful speaker, as a speaker initially, than Foley before him, and probably even uh, 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 O'Neill, yeah, than O'Neill, and probably even Jim Wright. Uh, took a great deal of power away from committee chairman. Right, exactly. And, 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 and concentrated. That was a great story to cover. Right, no, it was fab fabulous But, story but uh, it, it but collapsed. Okay, look. Well, that's the thing, is yeah. he <laughs> sowed the seeds of his own destruction yeah, to a certain but extent. But juxtapose yeah. the, the strategies followed by current speaker, Dennis Haster, with the, the, the media strategy followed by Speaker Gingrich. The it's, it's just the opposite. He cultivates his relationships with the inside. He works with the press on the inside, whereas Speaker Gingrich did it all on the outside. Once again, in this battle to shape public opinion and to, to help set the public agenda. To, to, to get back to, the, to our focus on the press, did the press contribute to this? Because the press loves nothing better than to cover a good fight, and there was a good fight going on on well, the Hill. What else are you going to do but cover? Well, and Speaker Gingrich they said... had to cover. Yeah. yeah, Speaker Gingrich had been saying, too, that I know you love to cover outrageous comments, right. and if you want outrageous comments and we'll cover outrageous comments, I will provide you with outrageous right. comments. But the thing is, initially, particularly in the first year, there were immense uh, accomplishments and immense things that, that Gingrich could point to. I mean, with these, uh, several of these items from the contract with America, we're getting 70, 80, 90 Democratic votes. Mm. I mean, there was a lot of pent-up frustration from 40 years of going along to get, uh, uh, what is it, going along to get along, mm -hmm. uh, to shape these massive pieces of legislation so that the Democrats could hold their disintegrating caucus together. And so then all of a sudden the Republicans come in and they're talking about things like the balanced budget that a whole bunch of people were talking about. And Gingrich had, Gingrich and the Republican majority in the House had a huge number of successes initially. I mean, they beat themselves to death to try to get it. But the thing is, is they tapped a wellspring of very, very deep discontent that uh, had existed in a large number of, uh, among the Democrats, too. And they got big, Demo big chunks of uh, uh, Democratic support for many of these major issues. Then, of course, they, over they sort of overstepped and things began, yeah, they overreached and things began to fall apart. Let me, let me turn to money, which is always a constant question uh, on Congress. I know, Kelly, that you've been working on a research project on the influence of money uh, on, on the Hill. To what extent does that influence and drive uh, this partisanship that we're seeing? Is that, a, is that a way to gain money, to raise money? I think so, because it mobilizes a base of supporters, and you have to mobilize a base of supporters in order to get the contributions that you need to fund these very expensive campaigns nowadays. I'm sure Senator Redmond is very happy not to have to raise the millions of dollars necessary now to to fund what are very expensive campaigns. And uh, you do that by going out and, and tapping a base of supporters. And those people don't know you as one that they should support unless you have given off the signals that they recognize as right. one, one friendly to them. That's a good point. How much time did you have to spend raising money every day? Very little. Uh, but well, you were unusual, though. New Hampshire no, is an unusual no, state. No, number one, I didn't take PAC money, so that made that awful simple. Uh, I just, I was the first one, by the way, not to. I just said I don't want that. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I did not raise a lot of money. I was very fortunate. I was outraised uh, the first time enormously. I was running against an incumbent Democrat, and uh, I, know I raised probably six or seven hundred thousand uh, dollars, and uh, raised that mostly in New Hampshire. Some of it out of the state. Second election raised maybe a little bit more. Raised it also a lot in New Hampshire, maybe sixty forty at, at that point. But that's because uh, I just decided I wasn't going to get involved in that kind of a thing. But I come from New Hampshire and. It's a small state. You can get around pretty easily. You couldn't do that from New York, Michigan. They could probably do it in Utah, but I don't think you could do it in most large states. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a scandal waiting to happen. Uh, there's too much money involved. Uh, I mean, Teddy Roosevelt, a Republican, outlawed uh, corporate money uh, years ago. Now corporations give hundreds of thousands of dollars to the parties who turn around and take that money and do so-called uh, party building activity. It's, it's, it, it's really a total rejection of, of, of the law. Uh, I, I, of course, as I told you, am a strong supporter of John McCain, but even if I were not, it wasn't. He's right. I mean, we got to get all this soft money out. We got to increase the limits, make it easier for people to raise money instead of those 1976 limits. Uh, it's it's just wrong, and uh, the press, uh, rightfully, 
is doing a pretty good job reporting on it and reporting where this money is coming from. The problem is that some of the largest amounts of money that are coming do not have to be disclosed under current law. And I'm a great believer in disclosure. Do, do you agree with that guy that the, that the press is doing a good job with this? Uh, pretty much now. Uh, I, think, uh, I, think we, I think the press got ambushed by this, uh, by this issue. Uh, 1996 was sort of the, uh, the flowering of soft money in the beginning of uh, the so-called issue advertising and uh, things like this. And <clears throat> I, for one, did not fully understand it. Uh, I didn't understand it as it was happening. And I think a great number of my colleagues did not either. And uh, uh, it is fairly complicated. And, uh, but we've done our homework since then. And uh, I think uh, that Senator Rudman raised some of the key issues. Uh, raising the hard money limits, the uh, legitimate money that you can raise, would be a good way to get rid of the uh, under the table type money. Um, uh, also, I think some consideration has to be given to state by state. What Senator Rudman needs to run is not the same as what uh, Senator Schumer, Schumer needs to run with in uh, New York. Uh, what um, uh, Representative Don Young needs to run uh, in Alaska, a huge state, is not the same as what uh, Representative Charles Rangel has to raise in uh, West Harlem in New York City. I mean, you have different geographies, different mixes of voters, uh, different media markets, uh, and different expenses. There, there will be change. It, it yeah. is coming. There's Kelly. an interesting issue here, too, and, and, and Guy was, is, is very forthright. I mean, this is an issue that did ambush reporters, and I think national uh, media have come up to speed on it, but local media still haven't come up to speed on it. And and a lot of these issue advocacy campaigns will come into a congressional race, and under the guise of some benign title, Center, you know, the the Committee for Concerned Americans will run some very harsh ads. And really, what's behind that that committee is some kind of an interest group that's that's pushing a particular agenda. And the local media aren't good enough yet to actually dig in and figure out who's pushing it and why and where is the money actually coming from. And that's, that, that will be a big issue, I think, in the next election cycle. Reporters pushed for years to get better disclosure of campaign financing. We now have the Federal Election Commission and just tons of reports. It's on the internet. Uh, uh, it's on the internet now, but, but there are tons of reports uh, in every election cycle about what the senators are doing, uh, congressmen Correct. are doing to, to raise money and how they are spending the money. Correct. Um, are we mining that information well enough? Well, we're doing the best we can. I mean, I, uh, uh, during the 1998 campaign, I followed a, a, a single congressional campaign and tried to test, find every dollar that went into this mm -hmm. campaign. And each of the candidates raised uh, over a million dollars for a very competitive race in Illinois. Uh, but at the same time, interest groups were buying issue advocacy uh, ads, uh, ads that didn't mention the candidates by name, uh, or that did mention the candidates by name, but didn't say vote for or vote against. And the candidates didn't even know that these people were buying the ads. They're using their money. If I'm the U.S. Chamber of Commerce on one side, or the uh, uh, or I'm uh, the AFL-CIO on the other side, what the AFL-CIO or the U.S. Chamber does with their money is something that the candidates don't know. They, well, if they, they do know, they've got a problem. And if they do, if they do know <laughs> it, they've got, to, they've, got to, to they've got a problem. Right. Right. But if uh, if the uh, president of the AFL-CIO can announce in March, uh, say, of uh, 1996, a crucial, uh, which was a crucial moment in this whole process, well, we're going to spend $30 million to elect members of Congress. Mm -hmm. And the Republicans in the House were just in a panic. They said, what can we do to counter that? Because we don't know, the candidates don't know how the AFL-CIO is going to spend that money. But the AFL-CIO did spend every penny of it. Mm -hmm. but, but this is easy for this is easier for reporters to track. I mean, the right. AFL-CIO mm -hmm. makes an announcement, and the Republican Party, which is going to raise money, responds to it. So there, you can start to track it. But there are these individual citizens That's out right. there who mm -hmm. who will set up their own committee and then will go out and get involved, and that becomes much more difficult to track. Well, and you so can't you, have track, right. you can't track that, but you cannot track the soft money given by corporations and other interests to the two committees, correct? You can't track that. Not that's not disclosed. No. no, not completely. That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a real problem. Uh, you know, uh, it's interesting. You know, everybody says this issue doesn't resonate. 
but in a bunch of town meetings in my state during this primary this year, you know, I'll see uh, John McCain get up there and, and say, oh, let me ask you something. Do you agree with the fact that, uh, uh, that and he'll list off actual corporations, they gave 100000 a tobacco company or this company, that company. I mean, tell me, do you think that if you make an appointment to get into the, uh, that senator's office or whatever, uh, that you will get in as quickly as they will? And, of course, people laugh. I mean, people are starting to focus on the issue. The Washington Post had an editorial the other day saying that the issue was finally coming to the point where there was movement. You can see that movement. All right, well, let me, let me quote you, Senator Mitch McConnell of Kentucky, chairman of the Senate Republican Campaign Committee. Oh, sure. Uh, just uh, last spring, in a quote uh, uh, in which we heard his actual voice mm -hmm. uh, from a conference to state Republicans in Williamsburg, uh, Virginia, Senator McConnell uh, talked about this. He denigrated this as an issue and basically said, you're not going to lose because of campaign financing. He said, any candidate who's fully engaged and knows what it's all about will not be in danger of losing an election over this issue. You disagree? No, I disagree, but I think Mitch McConnell reminds me of uh, the Japanese Air Force general who said that the home islands had nothing to fear from the United States Air Force in August of 1945. I mean, that's an absurd statement. Uh, Mitch McConnell ought to know better. I mean, if Mitch McConnell thinks that's true, ask him to go travel around my state and watch people talk about this issue. This issue is going to resonate. It's going to, it's going to leap up and bite people of both parties. Uh, the Democrats have been hypocrites on some of it as well. Both parties are interested in incumbent protection. I understand that. But time is running out. Would, would the country be better off if we followed the example of a number of countries in Europe, for example, and just simply gave free TV time uh, to the candidates so they didn't have to raise this enormous amount of money to pay for TV time? But I tried to do that for years. And every time I tried, every time I tried, and Jack Danforth joined me on a couple of occasions, former senator from Missouri, the radio television industry defeated us. They didn't want that time given free. The local stations. The radio TV industry did. Correct. And Not the they, national networks. And but how did the they local. gain that much influence, huh? Well, uh, you know, you'd like to be covered by your local news station, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a tough fight. But uh, I really think we're going to get there. Free time, limitation on soft money. I think this is all going to happen. And, you know, Mitch McConnell is election saying, cycle? Uh, uh, within four years. I'd like to, to raise sort of an objection to the idea of free time. I think members of Congress and other politicians should have to sweat to raise the money to do it. I mean, I think that politicians should know that being in Congress is not all a cakewalk. It's not all doors being open for you. It's not all uh, giving speeches and getting uh, uh, people clapping their hands. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, uh, I guess I, I talked to Bob uh, Torricelli, a senator from New Jersey, that there is the sort of unapologetic Democratic half of the, uh, of the fundraising scheme in the Senate. And he said, I'd like to think that everybody who came here had to walk through fire. And uh, to a certain extent, I think uh, raising money is really distasteful. And, uh, and uh, politicians who want to be senators, who want to be members of, the, members of the House, should have to pay that price. Um, well, fine. Nobody's disagreeing with yeah. that. Ways, I don't disagree with that. I don't think that uh, they should give you a check in the campaign and say you're a wonderful person. Uh, I think that you ought to have to raise money. And you ought to have the limits raised a bit. But I think the, living, the, 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 the field ought to be leveled a bit in the sense you're going to have these enormous amounts of soft money pouring into the, in the parties, uh, which, by the way, gives the perception of all the special interests controlling Washington. And, and the better like, That's my point. And the that's flip side all. of this, though, is that competitive elections do a much better job of getting information out to voters. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so much of our electoral system, from fundraising to airtime, is skewed toward incumbents, so that you have this re-election rate for incumbents well over 90%. Right. And uh, what that does is it, I think it diminishes the, the ability to deliberate in, in American democracy because you, you have an incumbent who can get his or her message out and a challenger who is up there screaming, please cover me too, please cover me too. And, uh, and Guy will tell you that 
in some circumstances, there's no reason to cover a challenger because they've only raised $10,000 or $20,000. We know they're not serious, right. so why should we cover them? Well, to some extent, they're not. That's right. That's, a, that's another <laughs> point to make. Point. That's another point. But they can't, they, they can't become competitive. I mean, what, what's coming first here, the chicken or the egg, right? But look, I mean, look at the, 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 uh, Democrat, the Democrats and the Republicans in the House, the, the uh, uh, organizations in charge of winning seats. What they want to see from a prospective candidate is they want to see $100,000 on January 1 of election year. You raise $100,000, you come to us, and we'll see that you can compete. Or you actually go out and recruit wealthy candidates who don't yeah, necessarily need to raise the money. But that's, the that's the least desirable. That's the least desirable. But, but, but Kelly, I think, I think what, what, what I'm saying, and, and I think what we're both saying, yeah. is that you know I don't care what state you're from. If you want to run for the House or the Senate, if you can't come in early on and say, look, I've raised $100,000, $200,000, I've raised that money, then under our system, unless you go to a total publicly financed system, that's kind of the bona fides that tell the people that, you, the game, that, sure. you're, that you're a real person. That's right. Now, you may not like that, but yeah. that's kind of, kind of the screening process happens to be right. money. That's right. Uh, that's maybe it should be IQ. Yeah, that, yeah that's, you're, you're right. I'm, I'm you want to that's part of the ante right. that, you, that you have to up. But it, once again, there are tremendous barriers oh, to, to, to challengers who would like to get involved and can't. And that's because that's they're not taken seriously. And they, they would be great candidates, and they could be taken seriously. But clearing those initial hurdles and getting recognized Mm -hmm. The only way to totally level that playing field, what you're saying is that someone who teaches school here in, in, in this city, and who doesn't know a lot of well-to-do people, and can't raise $100,000 in a short period of time, is not nearly as well positioned as a lawyer or a doctor who lives and practices, who knows a lot of well-to-do people who work or practice with them and go to give the money. And so you're never going to eliminate that unless you eliminate all private contributions and go to public financing. But aren't you when you do that, then you can do it. And I'm not for that, by the way. Aren't you uh, going to put politics in the hands of the elite then? You're saying a school teacher can't raise this kind of money and get into it, but a lawyer or a doctor can. Doesn't that make politics an elite business? There's no question. There's no question that there is not equal opportunity and access to politics in America. You have to kind of weigh what Kelly's point is and what I'm talking about is that you want to put this in the hands of, of the public treasury. Now, most Americans will tell you they don't want that to happen. So it's kind of tough as to how you get there, but uh, who said life was going to be easy? I mean, you know, who said that every, anything would be equal? We claim uh, we're a country uh, of equals. Well, we're not. It, uh, Depends where you're born, you know, who your mother and father were. There are a lot of things that discriminate in this country, and there's no question that to get through the starting gate of politics today, uh, you know, you've got to, uh, you know, you've got to have a lot of friends who are willing to come up with a five hundred dollars, a thousand dollars to help you out. It's that that's uh, that's true. And that's not good, but that's true. But you ask the politicians what they hate the most about raising the political money. system that you have, and it's raising money. Oh, they absolutely. all find it very distasteful absolutely. and very demeaning. Absolutely. But I mean, politics, and I think being in Congress, there are very distasteful and very demeaning aspects to it. It's a messy business. It's, uh, it's one of the things you were talking about right at the top, John, that it doesn't look, it doesn't look very nice. And people don't understand and that. And people don't understand that. And the thing is, and the politicians at least should understand that, and they should have to, they should have to pass that threshold. And well, having that, said that, I found it yeah. the most exhilarating experience of my life. I mean, with all the hard work Work and all of that. Raising money? No, no, no. Being sure. <laughs> sure. 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 No, no. no, I'm not that crazy, John. <laughs> As we referred to uh, Guy's previous comment. Let me, uh, let me ask you this. We have about five minutes remaining. Um, what could the press do to better cover Congress? How could we do our job better? Well, I, I would just say two things, I and mean, this is so hard, because if I were suddenly given a job at, as editor of the NBC Evening Nightly News, I'm not sure I could do it any differently. But I guess what I would try to do is to put some balance into the reporting. Uh, I would, do, I would do enough reporting on the latest scandal that was going on to make sure that people knew that it was going on. But I would then make very sure that I had a lot of in-depth coverage on the substantive issues that were playing their way through the Congress uh, each night. I, I think, uh, having, having heard this enough times, that I could tell you the reaction from the executive producer of NBC Nightly News, the reaction would be, that's really dull. Uh, how do we put that on the air and keep people interested? Mm. Well, 
That's why people go to school here, to learn how to do that, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the answer. Do you, are, do you ever find yourself, Guy, under, under pressure from your newspaper to jazz up a story that is, that's basically intrinsically dull? Yes, uh, infrequently, but uh, yes, I think one of the uh, one of the most unpleasant experiences I had covering Congress was uh, the first so-called Hershey, Pennsylvania retreat that the House had, mm -hmm. in which uh, House members, Republicans and uh, Democrats, who had been at each other's throats for months, suddenly decided that, well, for the weekend we'll go away to I Hershey, Pennsylvania, <laughs> yeah, and uh, we'll get... Uh, uh, We'll get lectures by uh, experts in human kindness and stuff like that, and we'll all come back and we'll all feel great about each other. Well, the press couldn't cover it, and uh, so I ended up having to write a story sitting in the train station, Union Station, on Sunday afternoon when they all came back and interviewing three or four of them on the fly. This, this writing a story about this on that basis was a waste of time, I thought, and, uh, but we had to have a story. so. Uh, so I wrote the story. Um, a lot of times, my editors will have ideas that I think are a waste of time. They turn out to, uh, not to be a waste of time, I'll say that. But for us, I think, uh, in, the, in the newspaper business in general, and in the Washington Post in particular, the duel over coverage is always between whether we cover today's mini step each day each day of the step along the way in the budget process or the campaign finance hearings. We cover that step by step and spend a little space every day, or do we let it go for two or three days and then write a larger story that explains things? Okay. And we all say, we all come away, we always say, well, let's do, let's ex do more explaining. Right. And the editors end up at four o'clock saying, well, what do you got for me today? <laughs> yeah. and, uh, so that uh, it's an eternal battle, and it's, uh, it seems never to be resolved. Senator, if you were teaching a class here at uh, BYU, and you were talking to prospective journalists about coverage of Congress, what would you say to them? I would tell them that uh, if they aspire to do that, then not only study the techniques of journalism and good writing in English, but study a lot of history. Uh, a lot of history, particularly not just American history, but contemporary American, European, Far Eastern history, because I think that's a tremendous tool for reporters to give them background uh, to what they're reporting on. I, I think that the education of some journalists has been too much on the job and not enough in their own reading and their own studying. I think it's very important to broaden your your. Uh, Views. In other words, you must know you must know what has gone before exactly. in order to uh, reflect on exactly. how that. Exactly. Okay. Do you think there is? Uh, do you think there is too much of the of the game as uh, as uh, Guy says? What do you got for me today? Yeah, there are there, there are too many reporters, in my view, uh, who are who are just not going to try to cover the dull story, even though it's a very important story because it won't get them on the evening show or it won't get them on the front page of the paper. I think journalists ought to resist that, ought to do quality work, and do the best they can, and eventually they'll get recognized for it. I mean, I know that in the last five years, the difference in how the deficit is covered is enormous. The story is now being told both in the electronic and the print media. It wasn't that way. Boy, back in 1984, 85, it was an impossible task to interest anybody. Gentlemen, thank you very much for this uh, wonderfully uh, inspiring and uh, lively discussion about uh, the way the press covers Congress. Thank you, and good day.